because you see the other thing that Nietzsche believed was that it was not possible to be free in some sense unless you had, unless you had been a slave. And, and by that he meant that you don't go from childhood to full-fledged adult individuality. You go from childhood to a state of discipline, which you might think is akin to slavery, to self-imposed slavery. That, that would be the best scenario where you have to discipline yourself to become something specific before you might be able to reattain the generality that you had as a child. And he believed that Christianity had played that role for Western civilization. Um, but in the late 1800s, he announced that God was dead. And you often hear of that <clears throat> as something triumphant. But for Nietzsche, it wasn't because he was too nuanced a thinker to be that simple-minded. See, Nietzsche understood that, and this is something I'm going to try to make clear, is that we, there's, there's a very large amount that we don't know about the structure of experience, that we don't know about reality, and we have our articulated representations of the world, and then you could think of outside of that, there are things we know absolutely nothing about, and there's a buffer between them, and those are things we sort of know something about, and we don't know them in an articulated way. Here's an example, you know, sometimes you're arguing with one of your, someone close to you, and they're in a bad mood, you know, and uh, they're being touchy and unreasonable, and you keep the conversation up, and maybe all of a sudden they, you know, they get angry, or maybe they cry, and then when they cry, they figure out what they're angry about, and it has nothing to do with you, even though you might have been what precipitated the argument, you know, and that's an interesting phenomenon as far as I'm concerned, because it means that people can know things at one level without being able to speak what they know at another. And so in, in some sense, the thoughts rise up from the body and they, they do that in moods and they do that in images and they do that in actions. And we have all sorts of ways that we understand before we understand in a fully articulated manner. And so we have this articulated space that we can all discuss. And then outside of that, we have something that's more akin to a dream that we're embedded in. And, it's an emotional dream that we're embedded in, and that's based at least in part on our actions, and I'll, I'll describe that later. And then outside of that is what we don't know anything about at all. And in that dream, that's where the mystics live, and that's where the artists live, and they're the mediators between the absolute unknown and the things we know for sure. And you see, what that means in some sense is what we know is established on a form of knowledge that we don't really understand, and that if those two things are out of sync, so you might say if our articulated knowledge is out of sync with our dream, then we become dissociated internally. We think things we don't act out, and we act out things we don't dream, and that produces a kind of sickness of the spirit, and, and that sickness of the spirit, it, it, see, it, its cure is something like an integrated system of belief and representation. And then people turn to things like ideologies, which I regard as parasites on an underlying religious substructure, to try to organize their thinking, and then that's a catastrophe. And that's what Nietzsche, Nietzsche foresaw, you see. He knew that when we knock the slats out of the base of Western civilization by destroying this representation, this, this God ideal, let's say, that we would destabilize and move back and forth violently between nihilism, let's say, and the extremes of ideology. He was particularly concerned about radical left ideology, you know, and believed and, and, and predicted this in the late 1800s, which is really an absolute intellectual tour de force of staggering magnitude, predicted that in the 20th century that hundreds of millions of people would die because of the replacement of these underlying dreamlike structures with this rational rational but deeply incorrect representation of the world. And, you know, we've been oscillating back and forth between left and right in some sense ever since. And, you know, with some good sprinkling of nihilism in there and despair. And in some sense, that's the situation of the modern Western person and in, in, increasingly of people in general. You know, I think part of the reason that Islam has its backup with regards to the West to such a degree, I mean, there's many reasons and not all of them are valid, that's for sure. But one of the reasons is that, you know, they, they, being still grounded in a, in, a, in a dream, let's say, they can see that the rootless questioning mind of the West po poses a tremendous danger to the integrity of their culture. Now, and it does. I mean, 
Westerners, us, we undermine ourselves all the time with our searching intellect, and I'm not complaining about that. It, you know, I mean, it, it, there isn't anything easy that can be done about it, but, but it's still, it's still a, a sort of well, fruitful catastrophe. And, you know, it, it has real effects on people's lives. It's not some abstract thing, you know. I mean, lots of times when, when I've been treating people for depression, for example, or anxiety, they have existential issues, you know. It, it's not just some psychiatric condition. It's, it's not just that they're tapped off of normal because their brain chemistry is faulty, although, you know, sometimes that happens to be the case. It's that they are overwhelmed by the suffering and complexity of their life, and they're not sure why it's reasonable to continue with it. You know, they, they can feel the terrible negative meanings of life, but are skeptical beyond belief about any of the positive meanings. I had one client who was a very brilliant artist, and as long as he didn't think, he was fine, you know, because he'd go and create, and he was really good at being an artist. He just, you know, he had that personality that was com continually creative and quite brilliant, although he was self-denigrating. But as soon as he started to think, about what he was doing, then, you know, the, the what, it's, like a, it's like a drill or a saw or something like that. He'd saw the branch off that he was sitting on because he'd start to criticize what he was doing, even the utility of it, even though it was sort of self-evidently useful, and then, he would be, then it would be very, very hard for him to even motivate himself to create. And he, I, he always struck me as a good example of, of the consequences of having your rational intellect divorced in some way from your being, divorced enough so that it actually questions the utility of your being. And it's not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing. And it's, it's, it's really not a good thing because it manifests itself not only in individual psychopathology, but also in social psychopathology. And that's this proclivity of people to get tangled up in ideologies, which, which I really do think of as, as they're like... They're like crippled religions, that's the right way to think about them. They're like a religion that's missing an arm and a leg but can still hobble along and it, it provides a certain amount of security and group identity but it's, it's warped and twisted and demented and bent and it's a parasite on something underlying that's rich and true and that's how it looks to me anyways. And Have you ever heard of data brokers? They're the middlemen collecting and selling all those digital footprints you leave online. They can stitch together detailed profiles, which includes your browsing history, online searches, and location data. They then sell your profile to a company that delivers you a targeted ad. No biggie, right? Well, you might be surprised to learn that these same data brokers are also selling your information to the Department of Homeland Security and the IRS. So to mask my digital footprints, I protect myself with ExpressVPN. One of the easiest ways for brokers to aggregate data and tie it back to you is through your device's unique IP address, which also reveals information about your location. When you're connected to ExpressVPN, your IP address is hidden. That makes it much more difficult for data brokers to identify who you are. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of network traffic to keep your data safe from hackers on public Wi-Fi. That's why I have the ExpressVPN app downloaded on all of my devices, phone, computer, and even my home Wi-Fi router. All I do is tap one button to turn it on and I'm protected. It's that easy. Make sure your online activity and data is protected with the best VPN money can buy. Visit expressvpn.com slash jordanyt and get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Jordan Y-T. ExpressVPN dot com slash Jordan Y-T to learn more. So I think it's very important that we sort out this problem. Um, I, think that, I think that there isn't anything more important that needs to be done than that. I've, I've thought that for a long, long time, uh, probably since the early 80s. Uh, when I started looking at the, psych the role that belief systems played in regulating psychological and social health. Um, because they, you can tell that they do that because of how upset people get if you challenge their belief systems. It's like, why the hell do they care exactly? What difference does it make if, if all of your ideological axioms are 100% correct? Like, people get unbelievably upset when you, when you poke them in the axioms, so to speak. <laughs> and it, isn't, it is not by any stretch of the imagination obvious why, you know, but there's some, it's like there's a fundamental truth that they're standing on. It's, it's, it's like they're on a raft in the middle of the ocean and you're starting to pull out the logs, you know, and they're afraid they're going to fall in and drown. It's like drown in what? And 
What are the logs protecting themselves, protecting them from? And why are they so afraid to, to move beyond the confines of the ideological system?